Good afternoon. I would like to introduce the ne next speaker and I, I shouldn't need a piece of paper to do it because I know Mark Mitchell, uh, who is a senior vice president of construction at Dominion for many, many years. And uh, we work very well together and have worked on many, many projects together. There is nobody in the renewable industry that I respect more. And that's not a knock on other people. This is just Mark is a very special person who is very strategic and also very tactical. I have never met anybody who can execute a project better than Mark Mitchell and his team. So for me, it is a tremendous pleasure to introduce him today. Utilities can be challenging for renewable energy companies because renewable companies like ours are small. We have you know, a few hundred people, maybe a thousand people in the field. Utilities are very large. They are normally very bureaucratic and they're normally not fast. This is very different with Mark Mitchell's team. They are very entrepreneurial and they have been terrific partners. And um, they have made us a better company by putting pretty high requirements on us as a company that we had to live up to. So his team is from my viewpoint, best in class and uh, Dominion has been best in class. Um, and they are building approximately a, more or less a gigawatt of solar every year and they're now getting into, into wind. And that's the topic of the day in a major array and also into storage. Um, they are probably in the top two or three utilities in the country when it comes to renewable energy. So as I mentioned before, Mark leads their project construction group, which is focused on the significant offshore wind growth, energy storage, and also still some gas generation and construction. Uh, he joined Dominion in 2000, he has been responsible for all these various generation projects in the company. Um, especially also new combined cycle and simple cy uh, cycle gas turbine stations, onshore wind turbines, offshore wind turbines, plus the one gigawatt of annual solar deployment. From 1982 to 1995, he worked in the utility industry on various projects for large utilities, uh, including construction and startups for four nuclear power plants. Mark received a bachelor's degree from the University of Delaware and a master's degree in business administration from Wilmington College. He's a registered PA. He attended the reactor technology course for utility executives at MIT and the executive program at Darton School of Business at the University of Virginia. Please welcome Mark Mitchell. First off, it's an honor to be here today. And uh, as Marcus said, I know this is a uh, tough spot to be in after that great lunch you probably just had. So uh, if you know I gotta go out and get a cup of coffee or something while I'm talking, like I, I understand it, so I get it. I'll just say, you know, I've never seen a change in industry of, of what's happening now. You think the utility industry is an old uh, stodgy business, but it's, it's just a massive amount of change. And I'll say one of our core values at Dominion we actually included was embrace change uh, to show you how much, how much we think. We're in the middle of a huge transition in the energy industry. It's one of the most significant transitions since the industrial revolution, and it's filled with possibility and promises for a company such as Dominion Energy. At Dominion Energy, we're focused on the clean energy future, including building more solar, more offshore wind, and exploring new technologies such as hydrogen and advanced small nuclear reactors. And I'll talk about some of these various things we're looking at. The core presentation I promise I'll get to is kind of offshore wind, what we're doing there, but I kind of cover it because this is really a journey to decarbonize uh, our system. We expect to invest $37 billion over the next five years in our capital program with 85% of that being related to decarbonization. And if you look at 10 years out, we expect to invest about $73 billion in what we call green investments. So that's quite a bit for us. The impetus for this transition, of course, is climate change. The United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has determined that combined land and sea surface warming must be limited to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels by 2050 to avoid the worst effects of climate change. 
amping greenhouse gas emissions down to zero by 2050 should achieve that. And that's exactly what we're committed to do at Dominion Energy. We have a saying at Dominion that actions speak louder than words. So we're not a company that just says, okay, everybody's saying, let's get to net zero by 2050. We are very, very busy working on very specifics uh, to get to that program. But first off, I wanna cover some fundamentals uh, that we need to keep in mind. Marcus mentioned we're a large utility. A lot of us think of us as kind of Virginia, a little bit of North Carolina, but we're actually large um, utilities across the country in many different states. And so these fundamentals are very important to us. And so for our employees and me personally, this is, is an exciting time, but to be successful, we must continue to focus on those. And so the first fundamental for us uh, is to make sure that we're looking out for one another. So safety is our foremost value at Dominion Energy. And we've made tremendous progress on that front, cutting serious, serious injuries by 70% since 2006. And we're proud of those steps that we've taken, but we're not gonna be happy until nobody gets hurt. And if anybody's ever worked for me on a project, I, my thought is we can solve almost any project except for somebody that's seriously hurt. You know, you can't solve that necessarily. And that's my number one priority. Reliability and affordability are two other fundamentals. <clears throat> the number one concern people have about energy when we talk to our consumers above cost, above environmental impacts, and above everything else is reliability. They don't want the system to break down. They want their power to be there 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. A recent example of, of where that did not work out was the Texas blackout about a year back. You may not know this, but during that blackout, 246 people died, many from hypothermia. It was also a cold stretch. Four and a half million homes lost power and property losses reached about $200 billion. So that, that is you know, quite an event. And while reliability is our customer's top concern, affordability is a close second. Having electricity available is only so helpful if you can't pay for it. So we're always mindful of how much power costs. You know, we look at our average customer bill, which for us is about $100 a month for the average customer. And we're always very cognizant of what every project costs, what every plus and minus is on that bill to keep it affordable. And in fact, our rates are, are below the national average and the regional average. Safety, reliability, affordability are key. And I would add a fourth one, sustainability. Our vision is to become the most sustainable energy company in America. Being sustainable means taking care of the world around us. It also means acting in ways that create a company that serves multiple constituencies, customers, shareholders, employees, and the communities where we all live and work. As a business that operates several public service companies, we see ourselves as part of the broader social fabric. Back in 1970, we were the first investor-owned utility in the country to create an environmental department. Since 2005, more than 90% of all cuts in carbon emissions across the country have come from the power industry, and Dominion Industry or Energy has been one of the leaders in that. Since 2005, we have successfully reduced our enterprise-wide CO2 equivalent emissions by 42%. This is great progress, but it's not enough. By 2035, we expect to improve that reduction to between 70 and 80% versus a baseline on our way to net zero by 2050. The transition to a clean energy future means reduced reliance on cold fire generation. Back in 2005, which wasn't that long ago, more than half of our generation on our system came from cold fire generation. By 2035, we expect that to be less than 1%. Some of you might ask, why isn't that 0% by 2035? And I'll say the one uh, station that's in Virginia that we have we have one that cleans up uh, gob coal, which is a, a, actually a great uh, benefit to the environment. It's one of the lowest emissions uh, coal plants. Cleaning up this gob coal also cleans up the waterways in that area of Virginia. So in our, in our state in Virginia, it was very important to keep that plant operating, even from our legislature, uh, for that cleanup effort. Most obviously, we are changing the way we generate the electricity our customers use. 
And as you've heard from others, policy does play a critical role in that transition in many cases. And one great example of policy uh, that they have in Virginia is called the Virginia Clean Economy Act or VCEA. The VCA calls for multifaceted approach to achieving renewable portfolio requirements, which will be a major step in Virginia reaching the goal of 100% zero carbon by 2045. And it also has critical protections for reliability, which I mentioned earlier, and affordability for low income customers. It includes among other things, 24 gigawatts of zero carbon resources, which consist of 5.2 gigawatts of offshore wind, and we're gonna talk about the first project in a minute, that's 2.6 gigawatts that we're doing. 16 gigawatts of solar, as Marcus said, that's about one gigawatt a year, uh, just for our Virginia customers. And we do other solar beyond that uh, for, for other parts of the country in our contracted assets business. And 2.7 gigawatts of battery storage. So it's quite a, quite a package there. Even before the VCA, Dominion, Dominion's renewable portfolio had grown tremendously. In the past few years, we've gone from almost no solar generation to one of the largest solar portfolio among the utility holding companies. We have about 2.2 gigawatts of solar in service and about 6.8 gigawatts of projects in operation or under development. By 2035, <clears throat> we'll have enough solar on our system to power 4 million homes at peak output. We're also developing battery storage to back that power, solar power when the cloud cover or during the winter when uh, solar generation is low. So now let me turn to our main or the main subject, which is offshore wind. Our offshore wind projects will be instrumental in helping meet the requirements of the Virginia Clean Economy Act. First off, I'll, I'll talk about three different areas of that. I'm gonna talk about a pilot project, which is 12 megawatts, sounds small, but you'll understand why it's, it's big in the industry. And then a 2.6 gigawatt project. And finally, a vessel that we're building to support the industry. But first, back in 2020, we completed installation of the first two offshore wind turbines in federal waters, about 27 miles off the coast of Virginia. These two turbines are located adjacent to the full scale project in development. They have provided tremendous learning for ourselves, stakeholders, regulators, and others in the permitting installation and operations. It's part of why I say two turbines, 12 megawatts. You hear of all of these projects, I just mentioned 2.6 gigawatts of hours, very large projects at the coast, but this was the first one. So it really allowed us to learn, like I said, regulators to learn, everybody to understand the permitting and operation. You hear about things just, you know, another example is, you know, Coast Guard has had a lot of, uh, a lot of input on search and rescue, for instance, in the Northeast. In this case, the Coast Guard can go out there and look. We've had them run exercises of rescue and people off the turbines. So they've got something they can also learn from, just one example. Another example is the capacity factor on these turbines. We had projected the capacity factor year round to be about 41%. Based on the operation of the turbines, uh, they've actually operated, so they were installed in October of 2020. Uh, capacity factor since that time has been about 47%. That's year round capacity factor. With that, we've been able to increase the projected capacity factor on our larger project, which will be a decrease in cost as well. And I'll say year to date, um, I'll get to it in a minute, but they obviously produce, you know, if you, you say, you know, why not, why not just do solar versus wind? As you'll see, I think we've got an all of the above approach, but in particular, solar and wind are very complementary to each other. So solar produces the most megawatts during the summer, uh, obviously it doesn't produce at night, whereas wind produces more during the winter. It also produces the most at night. So if I look at these two test turbines, for instance, year to date, so January 1st through today, they're at almost 70% capacity factor. This is the time of year when they're producing the most. So you overlay those curves on top of each other and, and they actually are very complementary uh, resources. So let me turn to our, our large commercial project, the Coastal Virginia Offshore Wind Project, that's a mouthful, or CVAL as we call it, is located about 30 miles off the coast from Virginia Beach and is expected to be complete by the end of 2026. It's the first offshore wind project wholly owned by an electric, or I'll say by a US electric utility. 
and it will be the largest project on this side of the Atlantic Ocean at 2.6 gigawatts, which consists of 176, four, lots of numbers here, 176 14.7 megawatt turbines. It will be able to power about 660,000 homes at peak output, and it will avoid up to 5 million tons of carbon dioxide emissions a year. That's like taking 1 million non-electric cars off the road um, or planting about 80 million trees. The full-scale project promises a swifter transition to carbon-free electricity and a host of economic benefits, which I'll talk about. But we aren't stopping there. I mentioned 5.2 gigawatts in that Virginia Clean Economy Act. So we intend to build that other um, megawatts as well, which would be over a million homes powered. CVAL is a key component of our company's strategy to reach net carbon dioxide emissions by 2050. It's also obviously key to Virginia being carbon free, net carbon free by 2045. A little bit about where we're at uh, with that project. Um, it's moving along quite well. So we filed a construction and operations plan uh, for the project uh, late last year. We expect the results of that. There's two main approvals you need. One is the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. We expect that approval in 2023. Uh, the other main approval we need is with the State Corporation Commission of Virginia, and actually North Carolina gets a look at it as well, and that is in progress now. Uh, we expect that hearing to start in May this year, and we expect the decision in August of this year. This project is about $10 billion to do this. As I mentioned, we are very cognizant of customer rates, so one of our main priorities was to watch the levelized cost of energy which in this case is about $86 uh, dollars per megawatt hour as we built it. That $10 billion includes about 1.5 million of onshore transmission as well. So progress on that is going well. One of the other key things for the uh, state approval is uh, the major contracts. So all the major contracts for all the offshore equipment and installation have been signed. That's about $7 billion of the $10 billion. The economic benefits of offshore wind are substantial. For starters, there are almost more than 600 job categories associated with offshore wind. And note that I said job categories, not just jobs. Those categories cover everything from, from uh, marine acoustical analysis to welders to IT support, tremendous amount of jobs um, that are ongoing jobs once it's in operation. The CVAL commercial project would create on average 900 jobs annually during construction and about 1,100 jobs once the project is operating. And it would produce not only power, but hundreds of millions of dollars in economic output and pay and benefits per year, contributing more than 10 million annually in state and local tax revenue. To fill those jobs, of course, we need trained workers. We're grateful for partnerships we have with community and technical colleges as well as other efforts, such as the Mid-Atlantic Wind Training Alliance, which will make sure workers have the skills they need to see, succeed in the rapidly growing field. And it is rapidly growing. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, wind turbine technicians will be the second fastest growing occupa occupation between now and 2030. Offshore wind projects also require a robust supply chain. Obviously, we'd like to have all of that supply chain located in Virginia, maybe a little bit in North Carolina, uh, and based in the US near our project. And that creates efficiency in installing the project and efficiency in taking care of operations uh, during it. So one of the pieces uh, that has been announced is Siemens Gamesa, who is our turbine supplier, is locating, is starting the supply chain, I'll say, and they're investing more than $200 million in a blade finishing facility at the Portsmouth Marine Terminal. Uh, in Virginia, which would employ, which will employ about 260 people. They also uh, expect to employ about 50 people in maintenance of the turbines once in operation. And this facility is expected to go on beyond our project. Our project has kind of launched this, this investment and it would be uh, supplying other projects in the country. For this part, Dominion has leased 72 acres and are working with the port to upgrade it to create kind of a wind hub, uh, I'll say a Southern wind hub in Virginia, uh, which can support projects, including ours, obviously supports our project first, and then it can support other projects along the way. With all these parts, 
you need the appropriate equipment to install these turbines. So one other thing I mentioned was we are involved in a wind building a wind turbine installation vessel. Many of you are probably familiar with the Jones Act. For those who are not, it's a century old federal statute passed as part of the Merchant Marine Act of 1920 after World War I. The gist is that American vessels basically should be used to transport materials between American ports. And you might be wondering, what's that got to do with offshore wind? So obviously if you load materials on a port in, in the US, that's, that's one point in the US. The foundation, once it's installed on an offshore wind project, is considered a second point in the U.S. So you have to have a Jones Act vessel to transport those parts back and forth if you use, if that's your installation method. To be Jones Act compliant, the vessel must be owned by a U.S. company and operated by American citizens. It must be built in the U.S. and it must be registered or flagged in the U.S. So we're leading the construction on the first Jones Act compliant offshore wind vessel in the nation. And I'll point out Brandon here, who's now going to Duke in an MBA. I know UNC will be not happy with that. He said Duke, but he was actually at Dominion Energy and was very instrumental in uh, helping us with the finances uh, for this project. So thanks, Brandon. Uh, but it will not only serve our project, it'll serve other projects um, in the US as well. So first one, uh, we're very proud of it. The name of it is called the Charyptus. You can Google this later if you can spell it, but it's a Greek. Greek mythological sea monster. Uh, we work with a company that had named five previous vessels based on sea monsters. So they were successful. We kept with the theme. So uh, it's more than 1.5 football fields long and 60 yard wide. It's about the size of three destroyers side by side. It'll be in service in 2023 at a cost of over 500 million and be based out of the port of Virginia. The steel for this ship, has been sourced from across the country, including some of that steel came from right here in North Carolina. And the project is over 40% complete right now. And we talk about offshore wind as this future thing with people working on it. Today, as I'm standing here, we have about, I'll say we have an excess of 800 people working on that uh, vessel in the US right now. So we're very excited about the role of offshore wind in the clean energy strategy. And we're confident that everything is moving along you know, per our schedule for offshore wind. Now I'd like to say a word about some others. I mean, this is a transition. It's an integrated system. I mentioned reliability. So we, we have to be careful in this transition that we're on. And so I'd like to talk about a few other resources. Uh, Marcus mentioned, I still work on uh, natural gas projects, which may be a surprise, but it actually is a, it's a very clean uh, source doesn't have zero fuel costs like solar and wind does. But one main problem or one main thing to overcome with some of these resources is they're not dispatchable. And certainly batteries are coming along to fill that dispatchable queue, but you know, heavy power uses or prolonged periods of uh, no solar or no wind, you still have to have a backup. So we think natural gas fills that role, uh, at least now for today. Uh, and it actually is, you know, we don't look at it as competing against uh, renewables. We actually look at it as it's enabled us to be comfortable in deploying renewables at the pace we're deploying them to have that backup. Of course, we want our natural gas system to be as clean as it can be. So we have a robust strategy for that as well. We expect to decrease methane emissions from our natural gas infrastructure 65% by 2030 and 80% by 2040 from 2010 levels. Since 2010, we have prevented more than 300,000 metric tons of methane from entering the atmosphere, which is the equivalent of planting more than 127 million trees. I'll also mention nuclear, and it was mentioned uh, this morning in one of the other uh, presenters. So we have uh, four nuclear reactors in Virginia. We have several more. We have them in South Carolina. We have them in uh, Connecticut as well. But we are looking at extending the life of those stations. In fact, we've gotten the approval to extend the life on our Surrey uh, power station, nuclear power station, and we're working on getting that same approval for our North Anna power station. As I mentioned, small nuclear reactors, they're smaller, they're scalable, they're also uh, dispatchable. And so we're involved in looking at uh, small nuclear reactors as part of, the, part of the pieces of the puzzle. 
So we're also looking at ways to reduce emissions through investments in renewable natural gas. We have joined forces with Smithfield Foods, Vanguard Renewables, and the Dairy Farmers of America to create the largest farm to energy partnerships of their kind in the country. Some of you might be familiar with renewable natural gas or RNG. For those who aren't, it's fairly simple. Manure from pigs and cows create methane. Instead of allowing that methane to enter the atmosphere, we capture it and then refine it to natural gas suitable for our customers' use. This growing program is essential to achieving our climate goals. Methane, as I heard mentioned earlier this morning, is at least 25 times more potent a greenhouse gas than carbon. After it is captured, refined, and used by our customer, RNG takes more greenhouse gas potential out of the atmosphere than it puts in. That's one reason we're excited about blending RNG into our natural gas pipelines. Lastly, hydrogen. We've heard a lot about hydrogen. Uh, we're investigating in the potential use for hydrogen. Hydrogen can do everything that natural gas can do, but with zero greenhouse gas emissions. Like RNG, we want to blend hydrogen with natural gas to reduce emissions from our homes and our businesses. We recently concluded a hydrogen blending project in Utah. We found, based on early assessments, that we can blend 5%, likely up to 10% hydrogen without any negative impacts to our infrastructure or our customers' appliances. We recently received approval to conduct a similar pilot in North Carolina, and we're planning to do one in Ohio as well. In closing, this is an exciting time to be in the energy industry. We must recognize that the clean energy transition, which we all want, is at the end of the day, an engineering problem. We can solve it through engineering, science, and innovation. At Dominion Energy, our direction is certainly set. We're determined to lead the way into the clean energy future and we're eager for others to join us. We're doing these things because, as I said, our vision is to become the most sustainable energy company in the country. And this vision is an integral part of our corporate strategy. Sustainability is not an obstacle to our growth plans or a distraction from them. It's a core element of who we are and where we're going as a company. Thank you. And I think I've got a few minutes. Yeah, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, anybody's got any particular questions? Yes. Could you comment on um, more decentralized energy or solar in particular, way, like schools or shopping centers or things like that? Is that efficient or not efficient? Uh, can you comment on that? Uh, it, it's certainly efficient. The one thing I would say, you know, utility scale, so when we look at solar utility scale, large installations are the lowest cost uh, per megawatt hour production. But certainly uh, homeowners, obviously commercial, we're, you know, we're interested, we're supportive of that. We've got a company that does that. The incremental cost per megawatt hour is a little bit higher, but maybe that still makes sense for that particular customer. But we're focused more, we're not focused exclusively. The, the VCEA actually, Virginia Clean Economy Act actually carves out some for commercial customers, some benefits and some goals for that. But the large, huge amount that we need for to reach these carbon goals is probably going to come from the utility scale projects. Yes. What do you attribute to the tax amount that we expect to bring at one farm? I mean, is it a normal year or is it a equipment performance? Uh, what, what we've, we've done a huge amount of work uh, looking at that. And, and I'll say to start with, maybe we like to uh, under promise and over deliver a little bit. So we were being a little cautious of, you know, how high we were projecting capacity factor. Uh, I mentioned uh, levelized cost of energy. So for our project, our large project, a half a percent change in capacity factor equals about a $1, $1 LCOE. But we suspected that it may be higher than what we initially projected, but we wanted to see performance. And it's not just that we saw the performance there. We also obviously did a huge amount of modeling. Uh, we used all the wind resources from many, many uh, wind resource of buoys and things that were out. Uh, but we had kind of come up with, we suspect it's gonna be higher. So when we operated the turbines, it, we don't think it was just one year where the wind was higher. It actually came out of what we had projected on paper, which was actually around 
And when you take into account like a larger wind farm, you get some interaction between the turbines and that's what reduces the fact to 43. But I'll say to start with, we were being cautious on what we projected. Uh, we had data that showed it might be better than that, but we wanted to see it, you know, so that was probably it. Yes. Is small nuclear specifically covered under the BCPA or is that outside of? It, it's not covered specifically under the BCA, although, you know, our, our existing nuclear uh, plants are obviously zero carbon, very much responsible for our uh, low energy prices in Virginia right now. Uh, and I'll say, uh, I'll speak for Virginia in particular, the legislative and just in general, uh, nuclear is fairly well supported. Uh, obviously, you have to be very careful to build those projects successfully. Um, we also own Dominion, what we call now Dominion Energy South Carolina, which is the old SCANA utility, you know, which had some issues building uh, the BC summer plant. So, yes. Um, state law is going to change in 2027 around uh, net metering. Um, the potential fallout is that it would uh, de incentivize folks to put panels on top of their homes. Um, What's the demand position and, and how can you bolster uh, consumer still do it? Uh, we, we definitely support the net metering uh, process, but we also think that uh, if, if the grid is gonna be the backup for you when you don't have solar, let's say for instance, then uh, you need to bear some of those costs for that distribution system to supply your backup power, I'll say. And the reason we think that way is, you know, if, the more people that did net metering without paying any cost whatsoever for that backup power, the more we're kind of socializing that backup system on the rest of the customers that don't have net metering. So we're supportive of it. Um, we think there should be some, some allowance for just the distribution system that backs it up. Obviously, if somebody has net metering and they're not connected to the grid and maybe they've got solar and batteries and they don't wanna be connected to the grid, that's a different story. But if they're connected depending on, you know, Dependent on that backup power, we think there should be, they should pick up some of that cost. Yes. How do you balance the permitting challenges for the amount of solar that the economy uh, calls for when it, calls to, when it comes to local land use approvals and incremental additions to the transmission? Uh, good question, and uh, it's part of the reason maybe for offshore wind and that, you know, that's a very large scalable resource offshore that, you know, is being permitted. But back to your question on uh, solar, you know, we've got 20, I think 24,000 acres under construction right now in solar. It is becoming an issue as we work through kind of county by county of how they get permitted. Are there zoning areas where they put them in certain areas? But it's it's certainly a challenge to work through to make sure it works out. And we see... You know, folks are coming up the learning curve on it and it's, you know, they're, they're getting there, but it's, it's a challenge with that much solar. Take one last question and then Marcus is going to give me the hook here. So. Yes. So with um, your understanding of that, because you discussed the uh, geographic diversity and renewable supply testing your site selection and how you would like to yeah, maybe if I get the question right, it's just uh, geographical disbursement of solar is good. And, and I'll use Virginia as an example is we, you know, and somebody, this was also mentioned this morning, but the load centers are typically not where the solar is being built. So we would love to build, you know, solar in Northern Virginia near Washington, DC, but it's not possible to get that much land and it's expensive to build there. So that comes back to transmission to be able to transmit either that or offshore wind. In the case of offshore wind systems were designed to, to deliver power to the last amount to the coast, not designed for massive generation coming into the coast and going back into the state. So transmission is a major piece of the puzzle here that has to be solved. Okay, thank you. Thank you.